Well, folks, um, I wanted to let you know that um, we're, we are having, welcome, first of all, welcome. I appreciate all of you who are on. I'm really pleased that as many of you have been able to get on as we've got. Uh, we are having some connectivity problems today, but we also have backups in place. So whatever happens, happens. Um, and we will do our best to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, Randy had some troubles just like I did, and he's going to be on too. Our focus for today is the Climate Policies 101. And um, along with that, uh, Randy did decide that he could join us. Um, Climate Policies 101 helps us navigate through some of the pretty complex, hard to grasp politics around legislation. And Randy helped by providing us about some basics, um, the various levels of legislative policies and the interactions that can affect local, regional, national, even international uh, legislation um, that, that can help us give it, get a better understanding. Now, there's a relationship between taking personal responsibility for making changes in our lifestyle and becoming an advocate for sweeping changes within the systemic processes. So I just want you to keep in mind that link between individual uh, action and systemic action. Our conversation today will focus on finding the courage and strength uh, to be part of the change that we want to take place. Um, We will be having a November webinar that focuses on communities making a difference. And we'd like to hear from you about any efforts your congregations are making to reduce energy usage, to mitigate carbon emissions, to create a sustainable flourishing of life for all, which is our vision of sustainable flourishing of life for all. And you can send me a brief summary of what's going on with your congregation and contact information so that I can um, contact somebody who is involved in those activities in your congregation and chat with them over Zoom and hopefully make a video of what you're doing. So my email address is sd, as in Bayan, sdoxley at yahoo.com, sdoxley at yahoo.com. Now, any time that you have questions today, please put them in the chat box. Since Randy is here, to share with us, it's really important that we field whatever questions you brought with you today. Also important for you to know, because we're trying to be transparent with you, that we do have an agenda. Those of us on the climate justice team, we want to prompt people to become actively engaged in mitigating climate change. But that can be done according to everybody's unique giftedness and calling. It can be in your own lives, in the lives of the organizations you belong to, in the larger systems that keep us kind of locked into a carbon luxury habit and lifestyle. So we value whatever you feel you can do. But I, I just want you to know, we are going to be asking you to step out of your comfort zone. You can start by saying, I'm uncomfortable with what you're telling me and move towards stepping into that uncomfortable space, thinking I want to do something more. I want to move into that uncomfortable space as part of being a prophetic people. Steve Beezy's definition of being a prophetic people includes discerning, envisioning, engaging, protecting the most vulnerable, and then finally, praying, planning, and acting in hope. And there, at each one of those steps, you can all find a place where you fit in and you belong. It may not be in all of them, but it may be somewhere along the line that is your specialty, your giftedness. So how are you feeling about that journey? What are your thoughts about becoming an advocate, an activist, a connector, you know, a voice for change, um, a planner, a prayer, acting in hope? What are some of the things that would make it easier for you to take on that work. We're going to um, have you uh, in the larger group, just share with us some of your answers to those questions. 
Um, the other team members help me identify who is raising their hands to speak. And if you don't see yourself, I mean, or if we don't see you, then um, please go ahead and uh, unmute and share. Hey. Not seeing anybody. Okay, Dean. So I think what we'd like to do next is to uh, just remind ourselves about some of the key points um, that um, we heard in Randy's presentation. Oh, hang, hang on just a minute, Dean. Oh, sorry. I would like to give just another minute or two for anybody that would like to respond to the questions I posed. How are you feeling about engaging? How are you feeling about your own um, ability to be a voice? Uh, what are your thoughts? Does anybody have any thoughts? I mean, you can express anything you want because whatever you say is probably the same as what somebody else is thinking. Yes, okay, Kay. Well, I'll jump in. Um, uh, I just, just Okay, and then Kay, uh, Kay after Judy. Kay, if you, I saw your hand raised, if you'll unmute and be ready after Judy. Go ahead, Judy. Am I unmuted now? <laughs> yes, but Judy's I'll, gonna I'll go, go first. I'll go second, that's fine. Oh, right. Okay, okay. Uh, I have been a University of Minnesota Master Gardener in our county for, I believe, going on 24 years now. Um, I went active emeritus due to a couple of health problems, uh, and it kind of cramps my style being emeritus a bit. However, uh, at our church, uh, two of us saw the need coming for... Um, some changes due to the uh, climate. And we had proposed to our congregation about 12 years ago um, that we needed to put in rain gardens to collect water, to go down to the aqua, uh, so we could take the massive amount of water coming off our gym roof and our sanctuary roof. And instead, of, I think it was like 183 gallons an hour that we're just going to waste through the parking lot um, and down into the storm drains. Um, and when we built when we built this new sanctuary 11 years ago, um, we had uh, lots of roof to drain and we did put in two very large um, rain gardens Mm -hmm. which are now 11 years old and they need reworking, but mm -hmm. they are functioning beautifully. Uh, and we also got rewarded from our county uh, and we were working hand in hand with the Soil and Water Conservation District. And I would like to suggest if you are in a county that has soil and water conservation program uh, through your extension agency, that they are set up to help. And there's even grant money available mm -hmm. um, because I know when we put our gardens in, they were spendy because you had to um, work through the substructure uh, and, and build it from the bottom up. Um, okay, and okay, if I could if I could ask you to, to maybe bring it to a close because we've got others needing to share. Okay, okay. Basically what it comes down to is we thought, we would have to fit the whole bill. And we got a $4,000 grant from the county because when they did the aerial, they found out we were connected to one of the very few trout rivers um, in the metropolitan area of Minneapolis. Wonderful. And so things are found out and very helpful. Okay, Kay, I'm gonna connect with you later okay. on and maybe we can do a video of this, okay? All right, uh, Judy, would you like to share? And yeah, go ahead, Judy. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I just, not anything I'm doing personally, but something that I found very helpful today as I was reading Christian Century just a bit ago, there's a comment in there that says, for a long time, climate activists have been a little bit hesitant to share the gloomy picture because of fear that it would immobilize people. And I've kind of felt that way. So what is hopeful to me is 
the the point of the article was it actually is proving to generate people moving into action so that's hopeful okay thank you very much um so just real quick think of a one word answer how are you feeling about becoming more active in this just how are you feeling good bad or indifferent just how are you feeling unmute yourself and let's just have a quick response in words single words Lonely. Say again. I said lonely. Okay. I'm good with being an activist. Okay. Less overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Less okay. overwhelmed. Less overwhelmed. Oh, good. I'm happy I'm partially set up. Partially set up. Okay. All right, great. Um, we might also recognize there's probably people among us who are fearful, uncertain, frustrated, wanting to back off. Brenda, did you have something? I'm sorry. No, my computer had quit on me. Okay. Yeah, I, I lost my connection. Okay. Hi. Um, all right. Let's go ahead now um, to the next section. Okay, um, we'll have another opportunity a little bit for you all to uh, share. Um, what I think we're interested in right now is, is just hearing what do you recall from uh, Randy's presentation uh, last week? Um, what were some of the key points that you recall um, from his presentation? And uh, then we'll kind of go through a list of uh, the ones that uh, we've noted as the committee and uh, make sure that we all have those in mind. Anybody have any particular uh, point or item that was surprising to you or encouraging that you recall from his presentation last week? Hi, this is Robert from uh, Ontario, and I can't figure out how to put the hand up. I've forgotten already. But uh, <laughs> what surprised me was that uh, that he said, you know, like contact them weekly, your your representative or or somebody. And I thought, sort of, well, if you wrote a letter, then that was pretty good. Um, but I didn't. I thought I didn't realize that an ongoing, you know, week after week, continued to to make your your thoughts known. Um, that surprised me. And also the, you know, the fact about emailing and, and phone calling, I've never done that either. I've always written letters. So, so I've got some ideas there. Great. Anybody else? Any? Uh, Susan? What stuck with me, I loved it, was renters of this planet. I loved that expression. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything that stood out that you, in your memory from a week ago? I can't see everyone uh, if your hand's raised, so unmute yourself and speak out if you've uh, got something to say. The importance of, of a carbon tax. Okay. Anyone else? It seems to me that he said something about the ozone was better off now than it had been. And that was encouraging. Mm -hmm. That was one of his examples um, of the past uh, giving us hope. Yes. Yeah. Others? I recall there were um, buried yeah. in the um, infrastructure bill that's coming up in the US that there were some climate things buried in there. And I remember thinking I should research that to find out because if you want to if you want to push your senator, you'd want to push them to not drop those portions because they're they're going from 3.5 trillion to one. one or one and a half or whatever. But so stuff's gonna get dropped off and um maybe a little more focus on what exactly to ask your senator to try to preserve. 
That's right. I, I, and man, Randy may have some more to say about that. There have been things that have happened in the last few days. So we'll come back to that one. Other other points, um, Mary? Yeah, I was impressed with the youth, his son, and they're going to lead the way. Uh, it's important to get all of us on board. Michael. Uh, yeah, I was impressed that uh, there were so many um, policies like this, the King County Strategic Climate Action Plan, the British Columbia Carbon Pricing Plan, the Washington State Climate Commitment Act. Um, I like I like working within policies and um, I like the fact that people, other people have done policies because then you can borrow information from them and if you're talking to someone, you can say, look, this, these people are doing this, so why can't we do it as well? Um, and it gives them something to, the people you're talking to, it gives them something to look at to say, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Uh, to be doing these things. That's right. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Let's um, pull up the slides of uh, what we pulled out as key points um, as a committee. And uh, uh, Joan, I think you're going to walk us through those that uh, weren't mentioned. Yes, so if we can move to the next slide, Rod. So just really, you know, a quick overview, and I'm really impressed by all the comments um, that we've received. You know, the first one was um, climate hope versus climate doom. And go ahead to the next one, Rod, that's great. Um, you know that we need to have this message of hope over doom because otherwise it will be overwhelming and disempowering cause people to withdraw. And there really is a lot that we can be hopeful about since there have been so many successful initiatives in the past. Uh, and that every crisis also creates opportunities if we look for it. So that was a really important uh, one that we thought. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that I see I forgot to change the title at the top. Um, so, you know, what makes the difference between good policy and bad policy? Um, and good policy prioritizes the main course, not the small appetizer. From a faith perspective, those small appetizers are important for us to be preaching and teaching and talking about biodiversity loss, resource exhaustion, um, humanitarian issues. But from a policy perspective, it's the, you know, getting where we need to be by 2030 needs policy ASAP. Uh, and that uh, bad policy are things that deny the science or supports inadequate actions and greenwashing, uh, marketing that makes us uh, think that uh, something's really effective when it isn't. Uh, next slide, please. Randy talked about the local, regional, and national policies and how we need all three. We need action at all three. Um, but that, um, I think, uh, uh, hang on a sec, okay. Um, but there's a process involved and um, let's go to the next slide. Oh. Okay. Um, I've me messed up in my mind, but that's all right. At that local, national, and regional levels, you know, the key point was how many voices are needed at the national level versus how many are needed at the local level. And it's at the local level that we can get in, involved and form networks and alliances with other groups and organizations that are already taking action. Uh, Raj, 
Robert has already mentioned the idea of a weekly commitment. That was intriguing. Um, there's so many ways to get involved. Next slide, please. Looking forward to COP26. I'm not sure, never sure whether it's COP or COPE or COP. Whatever it is, we're all going to pay attention to it, I hope. And watch for these three ingredients to success that uh, we're looking for, you know, what countries have started doing in the past year, what negotiations happen at the summit, and what coalitions and alliances are forming. Uh, I was intrigued this week that there's news of a new alliance that's formed in advance of it with Costa Rica, and I forget the other country, um, looking for a real push at this uh, summit to stop extraction of uh, fossil fuels, so completely stop it. So we'll see. Um, we're pretty confident in Canada that Canada won't get on board, but we can raise our voice and let our representatives know that we would support it. Uh, and the next slide, I think, is the last one. No, no, okay, no. That was the last one. Okay. Yes. All right, great. Yes. Thank you, Joan. So I think that's a that's a great reminder to us of the kinds of things that um, were discussed uh, last week. And so, Randy, I think we're going to get into a, a Q and A period now. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple that were actually in the chat um, uh, during last week's session. Uh, did I hear someone? Okay, great. Um, first one was what what are the key things that one ought to be looking for in a candidate uh, when we're voting uh, as it regards um, a climate friendly stance uh, in that candidate's views. Well, first off, thanks for having me back again here today. Uh, and you might hear a little bit of the roar of the wind and the like as we're getting the front pushing through here in Seattle. So if I suddenly disappear, you understand why. <laughs> um, but um, kind of to your question here, what should we look at in terms of a candidate? I think that one of the major things you want to focus on is how do they center this in terms of climate, in terms of environmental issues, how much focus do they give that uh, and what they're talking about as a candidate? Is it something that is peripheral to them or is it a central piece? And then beyond that, if it is something that's central, if you do see them focusing on that as an area of import, uh, how far are they going with it? Uh, is this something that is talking about um, some of the really critical pieces that we're going to see going forward, not just about emissions reductions and policies that will support that, but also the question of social justice. Are we going to solve climate change on the backs of the poor and frontline communities, or are we going to center them in the conversation and bring that forward as well? So I think when you're looking at candidates that are doing those things, that's going to be a pretty high recommendation. It's hard to be a single issue voter. Uh, and I always encourage folks to think, more broadly than that, but this is such an existential issue that looking to see how they're doing on that should be at least one of your major focal points for your candidates as you're reviewing them. Hopefully that came through all right. I felt like I broke up a little bit there for a second. I've noticed that uh, some candidates who center climate uh, also talk about its relationship to those other issues that you, you know, you say we ought to pay attention to and not be just single issue oriented. Has that been your experience? It is. You tend to see the strongest candidates uh, be ones that are well-rounded also. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've all seen in our following of politics here in the United States and Canada uh, that there are those who are, that are serious in terms of their focus. They will have a more well-rounded position versus those who this is their first time or uh, they need a little bit more help in becoming a more developed candidate. So we want to make sure they have a broader picture of it, but I think it must include those aspects that we talk about, yes, the role of emissions reductions, yes, the role of renewables, but also, yes, very much the role of frontline communities and how we have to be there to support them, not just on the mitigation side, uh, which is huge, but also the adaptation side. We know that there are things that are in motion now that we simply can't stop. We can reduce their impact over the next couple of decades. But there are communities that are very much in the crosshairs now, and we want to see increasingly politicians and elected leaders who are willing to look at that part too. 
Great. So some folks last time, I think, demonstrated their eagerness to start getting involved by asking for things like uh, scripts or uh, key points to be uh, presented to candidates when they're writing their letters and so on. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm wondering, without necessarily going into it now, if maybe, uh, I think maybe you and, and uh, Susan may have talked about the possibility of providing uh, some scripts we could post on our website. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, sure. Someone has asked about greenwashing, um, both the question of you know, making sure we're clear what it is and what would be some of the characteristics of a company uh, that is, in fact, uh, greenwashing that we could use to recognize when that's occurring. Sure. I think, um, you know, I don't want to get too cynical immediately with, uh, <laughs> if it's an advertisement on television, it looks glossy, be suspicious, uh, but not being so cheeky, I guess. But we have to look and see what what's their message versus the reality of their larger footprint? I mean, I, one of the things I focused on in the presentation was that, that entree uh, metaphor, which I know came up in some of the questions. We'll get to that more in a moment. But I think as well, doing the research, finding out what the broader impact is of a company. Uh, you know, if we're talking about, um, I'll, I'll put a name out there to consider because it, it's, it's one of the huge companies to, to Fair scrutiny. And when we think about Walmart, when they're talking about a, a focus increasingly on maybe renewable energy at their corporate office, or if they're talking about increasing their sale of LED light bulbs as part of their portfolio for customers to buy, that's all great, but it amounts to a fraction of the broader impact that they have on the environment, that they have not just on climate, but also issues where you have you know, massive amounts of uh, uh, <laughs> blacktop parking lot uh, with open fertilizer bags that gets run off into local watersheds. And are they addressing those things? That's been something they've had uh, been held up for criticism for in the past. So we have to look at those issues as part of this as well. So I think that when you take a look at some of the broader companies, are they doing pieces that are token? Are they attempting just to provide some advertisements, not really changing their behavior? Or are we seeing really clear uh, patterns in terms of what they're offering? Um, for their products, but also offering in terms of their business model that's going to model that. Uh, and I think that does include things like everything from stormwater runoff, which I'm getting plenty of right off my roof right now. Happily, I have some of those <laughs> cisterns uh, and the rain gardens are nearby uh, as well. Uh, but what do these entities with their large physical structures do to the environment and how are they trying to address that? Or are they just not addressing it and they're giving us a nice pretty ad? I've, I've noticed ads on television from the uh, fossil fuel industry associations uh, right. that really are touting, um, you know, the sense that we ought to be comfortable with what they're doing to, uh, you know, make the burning of uh, uh, natural gas okay because it's relative to other fuels, coal, and so on. Mm -hmm. To what extent should we be suspicious or skeptical, or are those legitimately uh, signs of progress? Yeah, I think it runs a different range of it. Overall, I would be skeptical just because the business model of those companies continues to depend on one central product, which is the extraction, refining, and sale of fossil fuels. Um, and I think that, you know, when we think about methane, for example, and when you talk about natural gas extraction, when we talk about fracking, there's that challenge that, yes, in terms of the burning of it, it may be cleaner than coal, so it has a greener image, but it's one where the methane uh, cap capture systems are there are prohibitively expensive. They're not required. Uh, at best, they're loosely enforced. So you run into problems about what they're actually doing. Um, I, think, um, I think it was Exxon that had a commercial here recently, or in the last couple of years, it was talking about their focus on things like uh, biodiesel uh, and from algae as far as what they're doing. And that's all well and good. But the reality is this is a multi-billion dollar transnational company in terms of its profit margin every year. And they're touting something they've put a few million dollars into every year. So it, it's hard to take that credibly. I think that's something that we should have a healthy skepticism about. Um, I know that uh, companies like BP have gone and even rebranded themselves instead of British Petroleum, now it's beyond petroleum. And maybe they're more at the front of that pack as far as what they're doing, as far as the big fossil fuel companies. But that doesn't mean that they're meeting what we really need them to do yet. Um, and these, you know, I. Even in the last week, I continue to follow this, and there's a lot of conversation now about the risk of stranded assets. Maybe we can get into the next presentation that is going to be a hard reality for these companies over the next 10 years. Uh, I'll explain more why later, perhaps, but 
they're watching their bottom line uh, and their bottom line needs to be something that is more than just their profits. It needs to be what's the impact they're going to have on the planet for now and future. So a, a couple of folks have uh, expressed uh, a, a need to uh, find ways to um, understand more clearly what seem to be very complex issues around our climate crisis and the climate challenge, and particularly as it relates to, you know, how do we translate that understanding into advocacy for policies of various kinds? Um, do you have any particular advice on how people can become more comfortable with um, distilling the complexity down into uh, statements of advocacy when they try to reach out? Sure, uh, you know, and certainly, that's asking for more than just a, a sample letter in terms of their electives, which I'm happy to share. I did write something up there and I was thinking about putting it in the chat space, but I think that's gonna be kind of a, a mess if I try to do so. So I'll wait at your suggestion until another time for that. Um, I think that the challenge of taking these complex issues and bringing them down to something that's manageable that we can all grasp and that we can move ahead with effectively as advocates, uh, in a lot of cases becomes, who are your sources? Who are you following? Uh, who, who can you read? Who can you focus on the like? Um, I mentioned the name David Roberts in uh, my presentation at least once, and he's one I continue to listen to on a regular basis. He has a podcast now called Volts, V-O-L-T-S, uh, which is particularly good. Uh, there's a free model. There's also a subscription model if you want to get more. But he's able to take, I think his genius is he's able to take the challenging world of policy and to be able to boil it down into something that we can dig into. And he'll take you off the wonky edge of the bridge to be sure if you want to, but to really be able to focus on here are key things uh, amongst all the different parts to focus on is, is really helpful. So David Robertson Volts is definitely one I'd recommend, uh, weekly podcast. There are certainly others. I think uh, if you want to talk about one of the little bit more widespread mainstream ones, Climate One increasingly does a nice job as far as a podcast, the publication, that tends to be a little bit more moderate in their voice, but they do a great job increasingly of talking more about the social justice issues. Uh, it's a, I guess, let's say it's a little more well-funded operation than a lot of the uh, smaller folks with blogs and those sorts of things that are out there. So I think the first step there, Dean, to the question is, where are people getting their information? Uh, where can they count on for that uh, to be able to help digest that? So there's a couple ideas. I can certainly okay. share more as you wish, but I hope that moves the conversation better for some folks. Yeah, I know, that's great. I wanted to um, get into your distinction between, uh, you know, use the metaphor of main course uh, dishes or entrees versus side dishes. Um, and um, I think uh, certainly uh, people understand those two entrees and the importance of them. Um, but there's been the notion that, you know, in order to provide a, a broad, menu, so to speak, of ways people can be involved, um, you know, is it still a value to uh, be engaged in the side dishes efforts at the same time? Uh, or do you feel that we just really need to focus fully just on those two entrees of the uh, uh, reduction in the, or the electrification process and the zero emissions by 2050? Yeah, and I think and this comes to the framing of one of the questions uh, that came in as well uh, about comparing this as far as the entree model that I shared, as you noted, um, side dishes being consumerism, biodiversity, and so forth. I, I want to be clear in terms of the point. When we're talking about climate, when we're talking about CO2 and equivalent gases, greenhouse gases, the main entree starts with the utility sector in terms of decarbonization of the grid and then must proceed with the electrification of all of our machines that we live with every day. So that's, that's one portion. But I didn't mean to suggest uh, that when we talk about biodiversity, when we talk about what is probably the beginning of the sixth mass, mass extinction in Earth's history, I mean, that's not a side dish. <laughs> that's in, in a related but an entirely separate issue in a lot of ways in its own. When we talk about pollution in the environment, when we talk about microplastics, when we talk about all those pieces and encouraging biodiversity, I mean, those are issues that relate to this that overlap, but also have their own separate sphere. So my comments really should be, I think, in terms of the entree model, should be, here's what we're talking about in terms of dealing with greenhouse gases, as far as the anthropogenic model of it. So 
just to give that its, its bit. More broadly, yeah, we have to move ahead aggressively. In, in tandem, at least with those pieces on greenhouse gases, we also have to be mindful of our impact with biodiversity uh, because it does relate. Um, you know, if you take um, <laughs> just the sheer poundage of human beings and all of the animals that we rely on the most, think cattle uh, in terms of cows, think about pigs, think about chickens. If you take all of that and add up the mass of it just by poundage, it's 90% basically of the living organisms on the planet if you are willing to exclude a lot of the insect population, which is not what most people understand. Most people tend to think that there's this broad, diverse wild out there as far as uh, animals and the like that still exist beyond what we literally harvest all the time for our food. But the reality is we have terraformed this planet considerably. So when we talk about biodiversity, I mean, it is an enormously important issue that intersects with climate because of methane issues. Uh, obviously, the less we have in terms of livestock that we depend on, the more we transition to a diet that is friendlier to the environment, you have the opportunity to be able to reduce those emissions as well. But we have to understand that the broader biodiversity conversation we're seeing happen across the planet right now, it is separate, but it does overlap. So I'll, I'll leave that to folks who are more qualified. Uh, I'm more of a social studies end in terms of the policy piece as, I, as opposed to being, uh, you know, uh, biology and the like in terms of a science teacher. So I'll admit the limits of my knowledge to that one to be sure, but it, it's clear it does overlap. So um, in terms of public policy and uh, local, state, uh, federal, national governments making policy, do you think there's a place in that kind of policy making for adopting policy regarding uh, lifestyle issues? I do. Uh, I do. I think there is. Um, I think it gets challenging when you get into um, the levers that you can pull uh, in terms of changing people's life habits, uh, particularly in the United States, where we tend to be far more libertarian than community oriented. Uh, we live in a society now that's thoroughly atomized in that, so it's hard to do collective action of any kind effectively here. Um, but I think as far as individual choices, you know, there's the, the classic question when it comes to policy, are you going to provide a carrot or are you going to provide a stick? Uh, and when we we're talking about the clean energy performance plan um, that I mentioned last time, that's at risk in the, uh, uh, the federal legislation right now, that has both elements. So when we think about this, how do you incentivize people to live a life that is simpler, uh, to give up things like, you know, maybe not all of your international travel dreams, but to really limit that? Uh, there are pieces there that come to individual uh, choices that, that do matter. I, um, I tend to be one that sides on, yes, the importance of that, but also understanding that we have a limited range of choices. If I want to travel, whether it's for pleasure or for work, I don't really have the option to go to Boeing and say, hey, you need to build the next jetliner that's going to work on synthetic fuel, one that doesn't have a carbon footprint or at least has a net zero one. I don't have that ability to do so. I can either choose to fly or not fly. That's where I am right now. Can I get offsets? Can I do those sorts of things? Yes, but we know some of those can be problematic. So when it comes to a simpler lifestyle, there are opportunities to incentivize. Uh, if you wanna get out there uh, really and talk about some of what those opportunities look like, I'd encourage reading a, a book that I recently read. It was, it's fictional about the future, but it's a little less fictional than any of us would like to see for comfort. Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future, has some fascinating discussion about currency and a carbon coin that is really breathtaking in terms of uh, the scope of what he suggests. That if you rework global currency towards that, you can really radically transform the power that people have, basically paying people to keep carbon in the ground or to sequester it uh, through their choices. And that could do a whole variety of things that I can get into perhaps another time, but uh, those are some ideas there perhaps that might back up what you're talking about. In, uh, in uh, previous presentations that we've had, uh, for example, around biodiversity, uh, one of our speakers also has pointed uh, to the relationship between uh, the, eco the ecosystem and population. Um, what role do you think um, governments have in relation to dealing with the, uh, the growth in population, which obviously is a driver of uh, the use of fossil fuels or energy of any kind? Yeah. Well, and here's the hard part, right? We get into some Malthusian arguments pretty quick. We know that China in the last 50 years has attempted its one and sort of two-child policy. And 
I, I do believe what uh, we've heard as far as this being a moment where we're looking at a fork in the road for humanity. Are we going to continue to push for democratic systems or are we going to fold to a soft version of authoritarian totalitarianism? Um, and the risk certainly of what China offered is that even in their their models, which is much more totalitarian and authoritarian than what we have here in the United States and Canada, is that they failed pretty abjectly. I mean, you've seen some curve in terms of it, in terms of the growth, but it hasn't been so successful. Um, so I think as far as strict population controls and the like, I, I struggle to see that happening as far as an element of policy in the way that's effective. What's interesting though, is there is a tendency uh, once you start to introduce prosperity to different groups that you do see some tendencies to curb population in those areas. For example, uh, the UN just had a report in the last six months that talked about how population growth in the world is going to be shifting its focus considerably. And that yes, we're continuing to grow towards 10 billion human beings on this planet over the next several decades. But sometime in the la last part of the uh, 21st century here, you're going to see that plateau out for the usual countries you would consider. But in other areas, it'll continue to grow. They project, for example, uh, that China's population by 2080, I think, or 2090, is going to be reduced from 1.3 plus billion right now uh, down to about uh, 785 million. And they will be passed by Nigeria, uh, which will increase its population to about that point. So when you introduce I guess market capitalism, consumerism, broad-based prosperity, you do tend to see the birth rate drop off a little bit uh, for a variety of reasons. We certainly see that in the United States and Canada. Uh, the average uh, uh, family uh, is not having 12 or 14 kids as we did a century ago in the United States, uh, but instead it's something that has dropped closer and closer to two. Why is that? Well, there are a variety of things. That as you educate women, as you educate populations, you do tend to see the birth rate drop. There's a um, project drawdown speaks to that more eloquently than I could. Perhaps some of you have heard of that, but they talk about educating girls is probably the single most important thing we can do globally to deal with issues of population. So as opposed to China's, I would say largely failed attempt to institute strict population controls. If you provide the opportunity for women to be educated, to become uh, leaders, to have more space in their society, uh, then you're looking at some pretty dramatic changes that'll happen with that. But it has to be, you have to do it pretty broadly, no doubt. Yeah, I think the speaker I mentioned uh, had that same point uh, to make in, in her um, positions. Um, we have about five minutes left or a little less uh, for sure. questions. I've been watching the screen to see what's in chat or and also whether anybody has raised their hand. Does anyone have a question that we haven't touched on that's just burning and you want to get an answer to it? And you can unmute yourself. Uh, Sue, go ahead. Sue Ann. Well, I have two. One I, one I put in the chat about, because Randy, you had said in terms of making ch changes in aviation and, and flights, that's hard as an individual to have much impact. But I'm wondering if there's a way, I mean, as in terms of advocacy and not as individuals, but as groups putting pressure on requirements for the sustainable aviation fuel develop. I mean, it's in, still in the development stage, I, as I understand, but um, that seems like, uh, for me, somebody who's really, really struggles with the idea of giving up tr travel, um, it's very appealing to figure if there's a way to be able to travel and it not have the negative climate impact. That's yeah. one. Wow. The second question is much more practical. Um, it appeals to me the idea of like weekly sending emails or phone calls to representatives, but I wonder about the effective and efficient use of my time, if that's the best use of my time, because my representatives are pretty much on the same page and they're often leaders in these issues. And I feel like, I'm sure they like to hear positive support, but there might be a more something I could be doing instead with my time that would have a bigger impact. So I wondered about that. I'm sure a lot of us in Seattle may feel that some of our leaders are, um, you know, already doing what we're asking people to do. Yeah. Well, let me take the second question first. And again, I'm getting a lot going on outside here weather-wise. So I really hope I can hang in. I'm trying. Uh, you are too. Uh, the second question in terms of for those of us who live in blue dots like King County or Seattle generally, how do we how do we most effectively use our time? 
I do think our continued advocacy, even with the folks that seem to be well on our page, matter a lot. Um, my uh, uh, elected representative to Congress is Pramila Jayapal, who most folks know is uh, was the co-chair and now is the chair of the House Progressive Caucus. So it seems like she's there. And I don't think that my advocacy with her is going to have as much push as it may perhaps elsewhere. But it is also something where, and this is going to sound depersonalizing, I apologize for this, Suanne, but in a lot of ways, we become numbers when we're making those, those calls regularly. And I think that does count. I think it very much does. I think, for example, um, <clears throat> referring to Jai Paul again, uh, she was one who had been hesitant to endorse um, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is an organization I take some time with, in terms of their idea of a, a carbon tax and refund. I mentioned it last time as House Resolution 2307. But because she'd had so many people connecting with her through that organization beyond, she's endorsed that, which is a more equitable model in a lot of ways. Uh, it is market-based, obviously, uh, but it's definitely one where we had the ability to pull her in that direction enough so that she's now endorsed it. She's signed on despite her hesitancy previously to do so. So I think it is possible to move our elected leaders even in these blue dots in constructive directions. But they will also turn around and take those numbers, those contacts and say, look what I'm getting. <laughs> Look what I'm getting, it's nonstop. I mean, even um, <clears throat> uh, Senator Joe Manchin, who's obviously been a lot in the news, uh, has talked about how he's getting a lot uh, from his constituents, not just on climate, but also on a variety of things from West Virginia. So they hear us when we speak loudly enough. So I really, I prefer for folks to continue with that. Does that mean that you can't diversify your argument to talk to other members of Congress? Well, hey, you, you can do that all you want, absolutely. And I know I certainly have. Uh, so it may be something that requires a little imagination beyond just your elected leadership here. One other one, Suan, is that when you think about our electeds, remember to aim for multiple levels. So it's not just Congress, but it's also your local leaders. I mean, we have a school board in Seattle, and you saw my son Spencer addressing them. You got a couple people on that school board who are gung ho for that message, and you got some others that are less so. And so we have the opportunity. There's a lot of space for us to do work here, to be sure. Um, real quick to your uh, the SAF question about uh, a sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, it was in the news uh, three years ago that Boeing took uh, a cargo plane on a direct flight from Seattle to Memphis and back using only sustainable synthetic uh, gas, which was a pretty phenomenal achievement. But that was also all that they had on hand because there's so many bottlenecks for it. So I think for us, it's that continued advocacy similarly to you know, to reach out to Boeing, to reach out to the, uh, to the uh, airlines and the like and say, and maybe coordinate amongst our friends and say, you know, I know it's not there yet, but we want to have these alternatives. We want to have sustainable aviation fuels. I am willing, if I'm writing to them, to pay a percentage more, a small green premium, if I can have that. And the more they hear that, the more they're going to respond to it. Uh, it needs to be more than one voice. It needs to be hundreds of voices. But that would be something I would consider in terms of your time. And you're talking about directly lobbying the companies, but what about yep. legislative requirements? Mm -hmm. Is that in the pipeline? Uh, I think you're seeing some challenges there, but you are seeing things like the Climate Commitment Act that don't have as many protections for the, it's called EITE, energy intensive trade exposed businesses. And to some degree that includes things like aviation. Aviation is a big deal in Washington state. You and I both know that. Um, and in the past, they've really hesitated to put them inside of that, that system where their, um, their emissions will be regulated. That's starting to fall by the wayside. It's getting more and more focused now. Uh, and I think that that's legislation that's here and could be looked at as a national model. So let me uh, um, mention that um, uh, there are still a number of people with questions. We had thought about going to a video called The Story of Change. But Joan has suggested that with so many questions, perhaps we continue that. And uh, so I think that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to just let you know that on the Story of Stuff website, there's a video called Story of Change that I think is sort of helps to move this conversation forward in, in terms of how uh, we can get involved in, in activities. But so I want to go to Jackie and Paul Bethel. And if you still have a question, whether you'd like to mention that now. Well, I... Uh... I envy those who live in, uh, we said King County or whatever. We live in Orange County. Um, so, um, you know, we can't throw a rock without hitting somebody that um, probably uh, doesn't have uh, the climate on their radar. 
I, I just went to our representative and, and climate's not even mentioned on, on her issues. Um, and the, you know, energy and environment is the only topic. And under that, it says we need to keep our beaches pristine. So, um, you know, I, I, I would love to uh, send her an email every week, but man, I don't even know where to start. So I, I don't know if, um, you know, I, I was thinking, is there some way I can find out what her voting record is on anything that came up climate related or um, someplace where I can start? I, I guess that's my question. It's a great question, Paul. Um, and I think that one of the places you can focus on, because it's right in front of us, is how is that elected representative going to uh, respond when we have whatever the final number ends up being, a reconciliation bill in front of us uh, and an infrastructure bill in front of us. The infrastructure deals with some of the peripheral issues in terms of it. Hopefully that uh, reconciliation bill will deal with having that head-on entree focus for it in terms of reducing our emissions through a utility plan like the Clean Energy Performance Plan. So that's one place to watch. Stay tuned with that one. Uh, you can find the environmental record uh, of those individuals. I'll see if I can uh, scare something up in terms of that to, to send maybe to the group to help out with that. Um, but I do think as well, the opportunity that you have in living in Orange County in an area that is well, more purple, maybe with some reddish tinges around uh, than where I live, is that do you, you just said it, you can't throw a rock without somebody who doesn't focus on climate. That means you have a lot of low hanging fruit around you. Yes, there are gonna be those that you'll never get, but there's a lot of people around you that aren't climate voters because they just don't know about it. They just don't hear about it. So it's an opportunity to connect with organizations that do have some of that focus nearby that are able to talk about it. And I'll tell you this, I mean, here's one, a couple tricks that I've used in the past that I think can be really effective. And I, you know one of them already because I showed my son on screen last week at the presentation. Talking about your kids, talking about kids in the neighborhood and the focus that's necessary because even things as simple as school buses, we all know the school bus, right? We have the chance to ride to one point or the other. Realize that school buses and diesel particulate uh, pollution are a major cause of asthma uh, for our communities and especially for those kids. So who wants kids to have asthma? I mean, that's, that's an easy talking point that bridges the divide between conservatives and liberals and the like. Um, another one to think about, and this was when I was campaigning for an initiative that unfortunately failed in Washington State, uh, is to talk about the impact of uh, things like wildfires. Uh, and uh, certainly California is no stranger to that. Uh, and the reality that we need to have policy that's going to help us through this. And there's a forest management part of that that isn't always popular on the very left side of the aisle, but I think is increasingly becoming necessary. But there's also some aspects that will preserve those areas that are more popular on the left side of the aisle than the right. So when you start to see these things in front of us, I had a conversation with a voter here in Seattle who was just about to close the door in my face on that one when I said, how'd the wildfires treat you last summer? And we'd just come out of that uh, 2018 for us was one of the first really big ones that we had. And that got the door to stay open for a little longer. We talked about it. I told him I'm an adult onset asthmatic. <laughs> for me, it was devastating. And he said, yeah, I've got kids in my family that, uh, that were suffering through that. So they know, they're seeing it. The evidence is right in front of them starkly. And I think that's as true in King County as it is in Orange County. So hopefully that gives you a couple ideas that are there. Coordinate, organize, get those messages, think about ways that you can jump across the aisle with it. I think that can be really effective. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question, Michael, if you could make it short. And then uh, while uh, we're hearing that and the answer, I think we're gonna start uh, getting ready to set up um, uh, some breakout rooms. So be thinking about uh, the questions that uh, Susan put in the chat that we'll be discussing in the breakout room. And we'll go over those uh, again to Rodwell. So Michael, what's your question? Um, well, more of a comment of what Randy was saying about the population problem. When the World Bank and International Monetary Fund attended to, to development projects in the third world countries, they tended to privatize both education and health and one reason poor people have large families is because they have high child mortality rates and they need some children to be alive by the time the parents reach old age to look after them. So privatizing health doesn't contribute to reducing child mortality and privatizing education doesn't help with education of women. So we need to direct some um, pressure on the 
World Bank and International Monetary Fund to change those policies of private privatizing against the poor people. Excellent point. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you, you do see habits in terms of policy by those international organizations that have held up the privatization aspect as somehow, uh, you know, uh, solvent for any problem. Uh, and the reality is we need public funding. We need public access. We need people who are able to get to it. Even one of the stories that just kind of relates that, Michael, um, is that a few of my students were doing some outreach work and they were digging into one of the persistent problems in, in rural India, in Uttar Pradesh province. And they had schools. They had schools that were there for young women to be able to attend to, but they weren't attending. Uh, and it was curious why, look, it's right there. You can have this education. The challenge literally was the bathroom situation, that there was no privacy uh, for women to be able to go and use the restroom during the school day. So they would rather not be there. So something as simple as creating a, a simple, small, enclosed bathroom that women could have privacy in, as opposed to the open pits or the fields nearby, was dramatic in terms of um, raising the attendance rate and uh, cutting down on the absences that young women were having. So sometimes it's as simple as have the facilities to get people comfortable to go to school. Uh, and there's a cultural piece to that in Uttar Pradesh uh, that may also be something that's experienced elsewhere. And that has to be publicly available, publicly funded, uh, and meet the needs of the populations in each part of the planet. All right, thank you very much, Randy. I think we got a lot of uh, uh, good questions in and a lot of uh, information in a pretty short period of time. Uh, Rod, I'm gonna turn it over to you now to uh, present the invitation uh, for our breakout session. What you should be seeing then in front of you uh, is the breakout session questions uh, that uh, I will again put up uh, on the chat so that you can take them in with you. Um, <clears throat> but there are three basic ones. Uh, again, we didn't watch the uh, film, so let me just, um, let's just take a look at that first one, what advocate skills best describe you. Um, so there are various roles uh, within being an advocate, and uh, uh, you can, again, go and look at that film later or go and look at that video later. Uh, but I think that the names themselves are fairly self-explanatory. There is the investigator, you know, the person who's way ahead of the, of, of the ball and looking into things long before anyone else and digging in for what's, what's really the case here. What are the facts that we know? There are the communicators. Uh, once the information's known, um, are you someone that, that loves sharing, ch talking? There are the builders, uh, the resistors. Um, there, there was, uh, I saw something in the chats about, well, what's the role of, of um, protests and things like that. Um, the nurturers, those that are looking for ways to bring uh, others along and to you know, nurture within the group itself because these are long-term processes and you know, uh, we need stuff that can sustain us. And then finally, the connectors that can broaden that out. So uh, th that's just uh, one of the questions for you to think uh, more, uh, uh, just deeply in terms of that, that the, the possibilities within that single word advocate. Uh, and then the other three, the other two questions, uh, how can you apply your skills and energy um, to the task? Uh, uh, at the municipal level, for instance, at the state level and at the national, does one appeal and what we and and we've already talked a little bit about that but now you can go into a, a, a little more detail are you drawn more to one is there more opportunity at one than the other and finally 
uh, can you commit to joining an action group of like-minded people? Um, we for sure don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are groups out there. It's usually a matter of finding them. So um, we will spend um, some 15 time. minutes. 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Thank you. Uh, and with that then, uh, Joan, go ahead and let's get into our breakouts. Let me say, I hope I've set it up right this time. Um, they'll be larger than normal uh, breakout groups, so it'll be really important for people to be concise in their sharing so that I'll have an opportunity to share. Okay. Okay. As other people gather, I will just mention that I will be um, having a podcast, doing a podcast with uh, Randy, which we will post eventually on our website. So some of the uh, questions and ideas that have come up, uh, we will cover in, in that podcast as well. Okay, and I, I think there are maybe a few seconds left for other, uh, one of the groups to close and come back. Some folks may have also just um, um, dropped off the call. I see we don't have quite as many now as we did when we began. Uh, so I'm going to give it a couple of um, couple more seconds to make sure that groups are all back. Okay, I think they're all closed, Dean. They're all closed? Okay. I saw um, Linda had her hand up. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Okay, the very, one of the very first things that was said was um, sending out to the uh, political officials letters and whatnot. And I, I wonder about, that bothered me because um, I know that what happens when you send out a whole swath of, of letters and they, they're all saying the same thing, they tend to be shifted aside and not, worked with not not actually recognized and i know that that happens sometimes not all the time but sometimes and how do you get around that so randy i, I see you're still on the call do you want to comment on uh, the relative value of um, sending out a letter that's been proposed uh, by an advocacy group uh, as opposed to something more individualized sure yeah, and I think that you do see that challenge that there will be times when it is when it feels like a form letter uh, mm -hmm. that it is going to be something that is not as well accounted for, perhaps. I think the tendency still is that that becomes a data point. Uh, whether you're doing that is the my organization that I'm part of says send this letter, they give you the format, you go ahead with it. But I do think that the tendency more often than not is that you do have that entered as a piece of data as something that is going to let that elected representative know. Uh, and one thing I pointed out last time was the, the, the levels uh, of engagement. If you're talking about reaching a United States Senator, you need tens of thousands of letters effectively then, or emails or phone calls, a mix of them perhaps, to be able to really register with them. Uh, but I do think, Linda, that the closer you get to home, the lower that price is, uh, that you have that okay. chance that you're, uh, you and your dozen friends making contact with a school board member. Uh, or even to some degree a member of your state legislature or provincial legislature can make an impact more so than not. So I'd, I'd stand by what I said, that the tendency is that those do get entered as pieces that, are, that become actionable. They're looking for that information, they want to hear from their constituents, and uh, even the reddest uh, <laughs> of districts in the United States will still see that, especially if it's a trend that they need to be aware of. Okay. Great. Um, just any last minute question anybody else has before I uh, get into some closing remarks. I'm looking for hands being raised. Not seeing anybody waving at me as I move between my screens here. Um, so I wanted to mention that uh, toward the end of our uh, breakout group, um, you know, one of the um, concepts that was raised or one of the, the sentiments was, you know, it's just hard to yeah, hard to know how to get support for stepping forward and taking that first step. 
And so I, I thought I would mention that uh, in our last um, webinar, in our last session and uh, now, um, we're really wanting to explore the idea of uh, creating some kind of support process for folks to um, help help us make that next step. Um, and so as you um, think about your participation for the next time, and as you uh, think about what you might comment on either in chat now or in emailing any of us, what value would you find in um, having some support among smaller groups of our audience uh, toward becoming engaged in the various ways that you feel comfortable uh, in political groups, in your own uh, local activities, and so forth. Um, next month, um, we're going to be, so I'm, I'm sorry, anybody had a question about that offer? You can unmute yourself if you do. I'm, ah, Laura. I think you've got your hand. Oh, that's no, nope, that's that's my person <laughs> on top of her box. Um, okay. Um, so I wanted to let you know that next month we'll be talking about your congregations, uh, which could also be a support group. And we can also establish uh, specific support groups separate from your congregation uh, or uh, a local community. So put your comments in the chat about what kinds of support you would find helpful in taking the next step toward being active in this effort. Uh, the third possibility really is affinity groups, not so much your local group um, uh, or your congregation, but um, groups that might have a common interest in a certain kind of activity. Um, someone earlier mentioned, um, you know, the ecological, the, the, the biodiversity loss, for example, perhaps you have an interest in that area. Um, and our email list that we have uh, for this whole effort is already a support group of sorts. Uh, we send emails out each month uh, for webinars and conversations and and we can keep sending out information uh, and putting things on the website that can be of help to you. So um, what we'd like now finally just to remind you about in terms of our uh, effort next month, the November Climate Webinar, is communities making a difference. And we're looking, as Susan had mentioned earlier, for stories uh, or activities that your congregation may be engaged in. Um, and we'll include those as we can, either on in the November webinar or on the website as uh, time allows. Um, and so we'll have um, that webinar really be a number of um, vignettes about things that congregations are doing around North America, particularly. I uh, look forward to having you all participate in that, and then we'll have a follow on conversation. The webinar is on the 14th of November, and then a conversation uh, as we're doing today on the 21st. Uh, and with that, I think, uh, Joan, I'm going to turn it back to you for closing. Thanks, Dean. Um, so um, go ahead with the next slide, Rod. We, um, we wanted to maximize Randy's time with us uh, today. And so we took out our normal meditative break in the middle. So I uh, want to give you the opportunity now, if you would like, to relax in your chair, maybe close your eyes. I'm going to read to you this excerpt from President Beasley's sermon last October about the essence of the role of a prophetic people in a time of crisis. So I invite you to let these words wash over you in uh, whatever way is most comfortable for you, and then I'll have another slide to summarize it. So what he said was, a prophetic people must accurately discern true realities that may not be apparent to others or realities they may not want 
to face. A prophetic people envision an alternative future in harmony with God's nature and purposes for creation. A prophetic people engage in initiatives that seek the best future for humankind and creation. A prophetic people seek just solutions that secure the well-being of the most vulnerable. And of course, a prophetic people always pray, plan, and act in hope. So on the next slide, I've highlighted some of the actions that were to discern true realities, envision an alternative future, engage in initiatives that secure the well-being of the most vulnerable and pray, plan, and act in hope. Thank you for joining us on this journey as we journey together into that future and we hope that you will um, come back again in November and uh, explore with us some more steps to take action. If you have additional questions for Randy, go ahead and email them to Susan or Rod, and we'll make sure that they're um, forwarded to Randy before the podcast is done. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and uh, our activity for the evening is over. I say evening, I know it's afternoon for some of you, or midnight for others. And go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to um, say some goodbyes.